Hi everybody, I'm Wendy Murdoch and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic and since we're still in this situation, the webinars have been going on for quite a while. This is number 126. We never thought I'd be here, but here we are. And I'm getting so much terrific feedback from everyone watching that I, even once we get out of this situation, I will do my best to keep going because there are so many interesting people that are out in the horse world that we don't necessarily know about and some really interesting ideas. Today, my guest is Annette Borg and she's gonna talk about iridology. Um, it came up in one of my webinars. I think you put in a little little post, right? And I was right. like, oh. a little question. Yeah, that just sounded so interesting and I've heard of it. So I just thought it'd be great fun to have you as a guest today so we could dive into this a little bit further and, and see where it goes. So thank you so much for joining me today, Annette. Oh, thank you for asking me. It's yes. great. So, so Annette, just give us a little bit of your, your background, your experience with horses and how you got into iridology. Okay, well, um, a little bit of my background. Um, I'm just a mom, homeschooled my kids, whatever. Um, I got into horses because I had bought my daughter a pony years ago, and uh, I was having more fun with the pony than she was, so I decided to get myself a horse, and uh, I ended up with, you know, like five or six later, <laughs> and uh, I had been, I bought mares that were in foal, so I had to learn how to foal these babies, and um, it was so much fun, and I've had horses for 40, no, 35, 37 years. And um, my original ones that I had over the years are have passed. Um, I said goodbye to my last one, not last summer, but the summer before. And um, I now have two horses, uh, a Tennessee Walker and a Porter Arab. My Porter Arab is astonishingly 40 something years old. Wow. Yeah, I rescued him 10 years ago out of a field up in Oregon. His feet were like this, he couldn't walk. 20, you know, two feet to the creek to get a drink. Um, long story short, I, I brought him home. I had a vet in my barn. And so she took a look at him and said, wow, he's like in his 30s. I figured I'd be putting him down in a year or two, you know, <laughs> and uh, just trying to make his life happy for a while. So then ten, now it's been 10 years. And when we moved back to California, um, he, uh, I had a second vet look at him. Didn't tell him anything, just asked him, how old do you think this horse is? And he was like, whoa, he's well into his 30s. And I said, okay, so that was 10 years ago. So he's well into his 40s. Structurally, he looks great. To, this year is the first year he's like slowing down a little bit. He's getting a little gray. Now, as an interesting side point, we call it up the river uh, where I got him from. He is the, I have found out that there were three horses all in that age bracket they all live within five miles of each other. So I'm assuming that there was a mayor there and she had a few foals and locals bought these foals and because they're all in their forties. Wow. Two are still kicking, yeah. That's amazing. I, the one I saw, she was so old, she had wrinkles. I've never seen a horse with wrinkles. The people showed me a picture of her like in 1970 something and they had bought the property then and the horses were on the property and they just let them roam. They just let them do their thing. And she had wrinkles. That's how wow. old she was. <laughs> wow. And so I'm sure that there was a lot of care that went into this horse to get his feet right and get a bunch of things right for him to be able to. Yes. Yes, definitely. Life. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he recovered. It took him about uh, six months, I would say. Wow. Yeah, That's pretty good. You, I mean, I've never ridden him because I've seen him buck. <laughs> <laughs> And it started with, I just let my daughter on for the weight process. You know, I didn't want to ruin his feet. Um, but every farrier looks at him and goes, yep, good foot. And they just drop it. And he, he's an amazing horse. He really is. Wow. That's really, really cool. And so, so how did you get into iridology? Um, I have a, a little boy and he was having some serious health issues. And my sister said to me, uh, hey, you know, why don't you take him over to this lady I know of. She's called an iridologist. She can supposedly see, you know, the health of him. So I thought, okay, well, you know, I knew an optometrist or an ophthalmologist can see the health of somebody. They can see their cholesterol and their whatnot. So I thought, okay, this, I didn't want to be hocus pocus, you know? <laughs> and so I went over to her and um, 
boy, she was right on the money. I mean, she actually stopped. She looked in his eyes and then she stopped and she looked at me and she says, I have never seen the breakdown in a child's eyes like I do in his. And so she, you know, tried to talk to me about all of his circumstances. And I was like, okay, here we go. So anyway, she, we did some herbs. He, of course, he doesn't like to, he was little. He didn't like to take a pill or a vitamin. So we had to kind of sneak in back doors with nutrition. So I really um, got uh, into nutrition. I wasn't raised, you know, by healthy eating habits. Um, and fortunately, he does like to eat healthy food. So that was a huge uh, help for him. So then uh, I kept going back to her a few times. And then finally, I thought, you know, I could learn this. And it would probably be helpful um, for my family situations. By that time, I was learning a little bit about homeopathy. Um, I was learning, like I said, about nutrition, herbs. You know, I, I was trying to find a holistic approach for this little guy. And so I came across this article in a little horse magazine, how to do equine iridology, after I had gone to class and learned about uh, iridology from um, the Australasian College in Oregon. And uh, uh, I thought, wow, win-win. You know, this is, this is a great, great opportunity. So I got a hold of Mercedes and I went up and took a class with her. It was very, um, what's her last name? Mercedes. Mercedes Colburn. And it's through the I international. Um, she's in Salinas, California. And this okay. was like back in Oh two, I want to say. So it was a long time ago. Um, and, uh, I really enjoyed what I learned. Uh, she, she had a whole course going. I got certified from her and, um, yeah, I was hoping to move forward with it. Like I said, life just started happening at lightning speed. So I got put it, on the back burner. It does. But so you learned human iridology first. I did. I learned human iridology first. And you learned that in what was the name of the school? It was at that time called Australasian, uh, but I think it's called American something now, but it's still the same school. They just have a new title. Um, it's in the same place, same phone numbers, everything. So, in Oregon. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. It's like, a, uh, I should have written the name of it down for you because I looked it up. But, That's know, okay. It we, can, my bio, we can put but. it in the description later. So yeah. like how, how old is the science of iridology then, the art of looking at the eyes? Yeah. It sounds like it goes way, way back. I mean, you will hear uh, accounts of, um, you know, like a thousand years ago, let's say, uh, people looking into the eyes of something to see the health. And I, I mean, from a general standpoint, you know, if you look at an animal and it's got weepy, droopy eyes, you kind of know, oh, I might stay away from that one. It's kind of intuitive. But um, how far back it was, I mean, I've heard of Egyptians and, you know, refer referencing the, the health of something through the eyes. Um, and then in kind of the turn of the century, late 1800s, 1900s, that's when it, uh, in Europe, it kind of picked momentum back up again. Um, and so I think in Europe, it is still used a lot more. Uh, I went, my husband and I went to a clinic in Mexico some years back and the doctor who was taking care of me, she was looking in my eyes for a lot. I thought, I know what you're doing. <laughs> And so she got all done. And finally, she says to me, Annette, you got to stop thinking so much. And I said, well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's always going. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I do think that, that there are, you know, more European doctors trained with this. It, it's a great little tool um, to use across the board in so many um, options of, of even medicine or whatever. I mean, walking into, um, just, let's put it this way. If I grab a hold of a farrier and he's not very familiar with me and I see something in one of the horse's eyes that references a leg, I'm going to grab that farrier and I'm going to say, look, you know, right here is the back leg and right here is the front leg. If you see him white, take a longer look at that hook. There's something going on in that leg, you know, in that area and kind of make him heads up. Um, I've done that with an, a really great equine chiropractor, two of them actually. And I've said, look, here's the neck, here's the back. You know, if you see anything in these or, you know, 
those are the points of interest for them. So going back to, you know, any, any um, massage therapist, any doctor, um, they, they can use this as a little non-invasive tool to help them determine where to start, perhaps. Yeah, it's, it's like gathering more data points and the more data points we can collect and then look to see, are they, are they all saying the same thing? Do they? Exactly. Fit? Yeah. And sometimes these data points, like you're mentioning, it'll be like adding, you know, one plus one plus one. So if you see something in, in a, a gland, like let's say the thyroid, and then you see something in the hoof, and then you see something like, I'm going to show you this this information real quick. So like this was one of my courses and this is looking for Cushing's. So oh, okay. it'll show the thyroid and then it shows this weakened area down in here. I and can't then, you know, just move that over in front of the, you had it off the screen. Just bring it. Oh, did I? Sorry. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So okay. then here is an actual pony that the one we lost and she had Cushing's. So see, there's that same mark and there's her thyroid problem. This little white stuff down here is just eye matter. Can you see that? Wow, okay. okay. So, you know, here was what I learned and here was the actual scenario. And, um, you know, so having that points, you know, thyroid plus uh, a week and something and a week and something could add up. So like, let's say this, this is another area. This is where I personally would really enjoy getting into helping others. Um, with their horses is let's say, let's say you're gonna go buy a horse. This, this has happened at our, our ranch. The gal says, I'm gonna go look at my horse today. I'm so excited. So I said, wait, what color is he? So she told me he was Palomino. So I said, okay, come over here to Cowboy. See how Cowboy's eyes have all this marbling in it? That's gonna be kind of natural for Palominos. But if you see this, and I showed her a couple things in, in Cowboy's eyes and I said, that's not good. So then we went around to the horse that I had referenced to you, I think, um, that had the uh, possible gastrointestinal problems. And so I said, if, you, if he has brown eyes, then when you see this or this, then pass on this horse, you know, because that means these are serious problems. And so she's like, okay, got it. So she ended up getting a nice, healthy Palomino that she says is way too much horse for her, <laughs> which is good, means he's healthy. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So let's just start with what, what's the basic definition of iridology? You would ask me that and I didn't write it all down, but That's basically okay. the definition of iridology is one aspect of eyeology. So eyeology is not like ophthalmology or uh, ophthalmology. Those are, have to do with more of the vision part. Mm -hmm. So iridology or iridology as some people call it is more the functioning part. It's like a map inside your nervous system that, that comes out through the web, the fibers of the eye. Um, think of a chiropractor's office. You know, you go in there and you'll see the spine and then you see all those little lines that go to different organs so you know which vertebrae and which nerve goes to. So they, he straightens you out and all of a sudden those things work better. It's, it's a similar thing with the eye in that all those fibers will go up through the nervous system and then they connect to the, the eyeball and those fibers will reflect the condition of it. It also reflects the inherited traits of somebody. So it's not just eye color. So if you've inherited a weak liver or a weak kidney or a weak, those show up as different markings than let's say a, an acute condition that, that's you know, surfaced for some reason. So we're essentially looking at the pigmented area of the eye. Yes. And yes. It's, it's not just a flat surface. It's made up of fibers. Correct. And these fibers in humans will have highs and lows. It's like looking at a map from sideways, you know how there's terrain that goes up and down. Well, um, when they're recessed back, you know, that shows more of a, a degenerative or an inherited problem. And when it's raised up and it's bright white, it's stretched those fibers apart. And so now you're starting to see a, a wider, more, you know, in, inflammation in the eye. And so, uh, and when it goes back, then those fibers have separated and there's darkness back behind there. So, you know, it shows a different type of condition. 
So um, we're looking at, at color variation from light to dark in relation to the coloration of the eye itself. Yes. Um, like that picture I showed you with this little pony, you know, her eye color is dark. And you can see how the acute condition has showed up white in there. Right. You know, up over here. So, you know, that helps. Then you get a, you know, a lighter colored eye horse, you know, and um, it'll, it'll reflect a little bit differently. The only other, with horses, I think it's interesting. So I don't know, if that, let me show you this. Can you see that okay? Yeah. So you see the little uh, parts up there, the little upside down mountains that kind yep. of, they call that the shelf in the eye. It has a big long name that I've never memorized, but um, that is like a thumbprint on a horse. And so if you get a good picture like this, you can positively ID your horse. Uh, you know, it's, it's a unique thing for them. It will always, always be the same. Um, so I, at one time, I think there was even a, a company called ID or something like that. And they were going to be used for events, eventing type things to make sure that the horses that the rider was going to use that day was actually the horse that, oh, wow. that was supposed to. Like a thumbprint. Not, I don't know. I read about it somewhere. And so I contacted them. I loved your, I loved your camera. How does that work? Yeah. Well, and, and that's okay. So, so then, but basically someone or some group of people have mapped out the eye to determine uh, yes. different, different organs uh, will be presented in different places across the eye, the eye. Correct. And I'm sure that that's something, like you say, that this is, is, probably a thousand years old, that, that takes time seeing lots and lots of eyes and starting to see health-related issues along with the patterns in the eye. And just like so many um, more ancient arts like acupuncture and that kind of thing where they've, they've you know, mapped it out and, and determined it. And science in some ways is just catching up with some of those ideas like acupuncture. Um, exactly. But, you know, it's obviously been a, a form of medicine for a very long time in the Chinese world with acupuncture. And so, so this correlation, and I know with ears and with feet, there's meridian maps, right, for your ears and your feet, Correct. where there's um, endings to the meridian. So, oh, you've got, yep, there we go. Perfect. An inclined acupressure chart. Right. And so, um, you know, we could we could just kind of say as an um, example, not it's not necessarily accurate, but that the the representation that map is in the eye, and so we can there's a the whole body is is um, located yeah, there. So is, is there a, like a chart that shows yeah. us? Yeah, absolutely. And this is the one that came from my school that I learned about. Oh, cool. All right. And so yeah. um, is that a chart if that's, that we can acquire? Is there somewhere where if someone wanted to get a chart? Yeah, this one's through Mercedes. Okay. So uh, through the Eye International. Through the Eye International. Great. Yeah. And then if you put in, you know, Mercedes Colburn. It's Colburn. Really, yep. Yeah. Uh, Animal Iridology Center, something like that. It, it may, it, it should uh, Google itself around. Cool. Yeah, because that would be a really handy chart. <laughs> yeah, and I loved it. I've had that one for years and it sits in my trailer usually and that way I can reference that. And I usually keep, uh, you know, like one of these and a little little thing too so that if I see something I can grab it and, and uh, it's just a smaller version of the big one. Exactly. Yeah, very handy. And I think that different uh, teachers of iridology, equine iridology, have probably come up with their own uh, version of their map. Um, like one place that I, I looked into, because I'd like to go for a double certification, actually, because I have been, you know, almost 20 years not learning new things. Right. So I'd be interested to find out how much thing is it kind of stayed the same or has there really been a lot of progress with this. Um, but uh, one of them actually said that they only have one reading for the hoofs. They haven't found like a front hoof and a back hoof, which I was taught front hoof, back hoof. Mm -hmm. And that and there might be reasons why they've come up with
with that. So I, I'd like to run out and find out sure. why. Yeah. And how similar is the human eye map to the horse eye map? Very, very similar. Um, do I have a human eye map? I didn't put one of those out for you. Well, here, look. Yeah, because I'm just kind of curious, you know, our eyes are a different shape. There's more almond. Yes, shape. that's oh, true. Oh, yeah, here we go. There we go. I did. So here's what a, a, you know, a human one would look like. A lot more intricate, you might say, mm -hmm. than the, um, the horse one. And the horse one, they have made a lot, you know, for the, the different shape of the eye. They didn't go so round. They, you know, right. adjusted it, which really does help. Um, the pupils are different too. You know, the horse's pupil for the most part is much more rectangular. The human eye is, is much more round. And in, like I was mentioning before, eyeology, I'm just in the iridology part, but there's sclerology. It's where you can look at the white part of your eyes and all those little vessels and vascular, they have their own map that, oh, you know, wow. be mapped out in the sclerera. And certain vessels, if they're straight, that means one thing. If they're curly, that means something. If they're thick, that means something else. So that's a whole nother avenue, um, which I have used in people more so than horses. Um, I try not to be invasive with anybody, you know. <laughs> Let me look at <laughs> your eye. Yeah. <laughs> a couple times, like I was out shopping one day and the lady, she rolled her eyes sideways and right in her heart zone. I was like, Oh my gosh, do I say something or not? I'm not being, you know, I don't want to get in her business. So I just casually asked her how she felt and, you know, kind of questions. And as it turned out, she heard she has a family history of heart problems and that she was feeling a little bit like she should be a little more proactive. So I encouraged her to make her appointment and go be proactive. And, you know, here's a good doctor, find out about this test or that test, you know, left it that. I came back a some months later, it was a beating shop. So I went back some months later, she goes, I went to the doctor, it was the best appointment I've had and I got all this, you know, so. Wow. Like said, fluorology can have its benefits because it, it, it has a quick, you know, map that you can maybe see easy. Wow, and I, I've never even heard of that. I didn't know yeah. that was something that's- uh, Let's see, what other, there's also the pupils will be, uh, have their own um, reference. So like, let's say, this little eye, see how big the pupil is? Yeah. And that, that's in, uh, reflective of a nervous system that is too relaxed. There's no, you know, no give and take with it. So, you know, that can affect a, a person's, so, but, but even the, the whole pupilology, I'll call it, I don't know what the official name is. I've only dealt with it once or twice, and it was because it was very unusual and I knew nothing about it. I just went and got my chart and I showed the lady and I said, look, your pupil is reflecting this. And I read what it meant and I said, do you think that, you know, it's with you? And she was kind of like, well, maybe a little bit, you know? And I said, well, you might, and they were neurological things. So I encouraged her to just maybe go get that checked. Wow. And then I uh, one time went to an eye doctor where he ran me through a whole battery of tests and then he could tell exactly how I learned. And yeah, I, I can I imagine. Don't know what that's called exactly. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't looking at the health of my eye, but the way I perceived information. And yes. I've never forgotten. There's a name for it. And of course, I've forgotten what that is. But it was fascinating because one of the first things he said to me is you're not designed to do like like admin papers and that kind of thing. And it was like, no. Oh, see. Yeah, he asked me well, how I and, did it. And there, there is some truth to that. And my son um, has vision problems anyway, the one who has the health challenges. And I had to take him to, um, what did they call it? Uh, uh, a specialist. Uh, it was a, an eye, why can't I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, I turned 60 this year, I guess. That's what <laughs> <laughs> And so anyway, um, he had to go through eye therapy. And so when I, and it was like jumping on trampolines and reading charts and, you know, he had a whiteboard over here and he had to make numbers and try and get them columnized and his brain didn't work that way. And, and it was fascinating for me because the doctor, A, described my child to a T. You know, he told me children who have this problem typically have these behavioral issues too. And I was like, oh, I could just 
just kiss you. You know? Yeah. you know my son, this is great. But he explained to me that, remember on the old time computers, how there were so many pixels you could see? Yeah. And he says, that's how his vision works. He's pixelated. He's not high definition. Wow. So even when he wears glasses to protect, to think, you know, uh, adjust his vision, that doesn't mean that over the optic nerve, the, the, the information is going into his brain accurately. So, you know, you know the, the more you learn about eyes, the more it, it becomes fascinating because there's so many different levels, not, not just, you know, you know, when you go to the eye doctor, yeah, you have 20, 20 vision or whatever, and that your eye is healthy, but there, you know, the, we're starting to realize there's layer upon layer upon layer of information that we can gather from our eye, which is really, really fascinating. Yeah. So um, when we look at a horse, does a horse's pupil change like people? Yes, mm -hmm. they do. Um, yeah, they, they can change quite a bit. Um, you know, of course they get smaller and bigger and they can even round out a little bit. Um, whether that's directly a attached to the nervous system of the horse, those are questions that I would like to see addressed. I have kind of my own, uh, area where I would really like to specialize in, uh, once I get going more so, and that's more that gut brain axis. Um, because, you know, we always say the health of the horse is in the gut. And when I see, you know, low stomach acid in a horse or perhaps elevated problems with a, a horse uh, with their digestive problems, like the ones we talked about, could it be ulcers? I mean, you can't diagnose with iridology. You have right. to remember that. I kind of think of it like being the ultrasound technician. You can get in there and see the tissue, but it's the doctor's job to, to look and see that what what name he's going to put on it you know and how to address it from there so you know a lot of times with your doctor's your your vet's permission you know can you you can ask me can i is it okay if i include some herbs can i do some you know essential oils can i do some box flowers can i do you know some of these other remedies get some massage therapists you know barrier work you know um surefoot people you know <laughs> Well, and that's just it. You know, what we're, we're, that they can't speak to us in words that we can understand to tell okay. us what's going on. And even when they can, so how many people do you know that go, oh, I'm fine, you know, and really they're not fine. So, right. you know, we always have to play detective to try and figure out, you know, what's going on today? Is there something going on? You know, what can we do to make you uh, feel better or healthier just in general yes. so that, you know, you can live to 40 something years old and be a really you know happy yeah. and alive and vibrant citizen in this world so yes. um you know so the uh, to me iridology is just another way to gather another data point another piece of information and then like everything we want to go back and and compare and contrast and confer and find out does this fit with the other things i know about the horse is there a test we can do to see does this confirm that um or maybe we look at the foot and go wow yeah maybe there's something we can do here so we're always trying to seek optimum health and anytime we can gather a little more information, like already I'm thinking about my horses, it's like, okay, so first question, how do I take a good picture of my horse's eye? Because yeah. you need a good picture in order to even look at this chart, right? They're not yes. gonna stand there with me just trying to stare into their eye. Well, well, this is kind of a, a funny way around it. This is normally what happens when you wanna take a picture of their <laughs> eye. What? <laughs> And then, and then you get, oh yeah, I forgot to tie up your mane. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and then you get this great picture, but what do you see? You get a reflection. So what you yes. see is the person with the camera. Yeah, exactly. So even in this book, he, that's what he did. He got yeah, I think that's a great, great photo. And, and you have a lot of resources there. A lot of people I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I kind of learned a few things from you too. <laughs> That's so yes, getting a good picture is uh, very important. A lot of times when I'm out at the ranch and the sunlight just happens to be right, um, I will get a, a head and turn it a certain way and you can see all the, the, the dimensions of it. Um, I get a quick glimpse, that's about, some, and I have to put it to memory, you know, it's like, okay, I saw this, this, and this, you know, go write it down or take another look, whatever the case may be. Um, so sometimes the sun shines just right and you can, you can get a, a, a fair view. Um, it, it has to be taken with no backlight. So if you're going to take a picture of your horse, find a kind of a dark corner and get the light behind your camera and then 
that seems to help quite a bit. Um, yeah, a lot of times it's hit and miss. I, uh, there are cameras made that will, that have this little special camera that just goes right on the pupil. And that's how you get these, these great pictures like this. You know, oh, you okay. So it's a really special camera for, for those. Yeah. Kids. Yeah. Now I, I have a vet friend and um, she was perplexed by a horse about a year ago and she does, she specializes in dental care and acupuncture for horses. And so she had a client that had some issues with their horse that they couldn't find any reason for. Um, so she sent me a picture and I told her what I saw. And I also told her, you know, how are the feet? Cause they're looking kind of funky. And she's looked, she said, texted back and said, no, feet are fine. And I was like, mm, maybe not, you know, so look for the future. Maybe the feet are ahead. Maybe the inflammation that's being shown is ahead of the, the actual outcome of the feet. But it could have been if I had seen the whole eye, because I got kind of the half bottom portion of it. So I told her what I could see. But again, that one plus one plus one, did it have a thyroid? Does it have a foot? Is it headed for Cushing's? You know, that could have been a, a, an outcome that might have been easier to see if you're there, you know. Right, right. So, so if someone wanted to like go out and take a picture of their horse, they want to make sure it's kind of in a dark, darker environment with a light behind them. And of course, get the mane out of the way. Um, that's the nice thing about our iPhones now. They're so much smaller and easier to get a camera up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and sometimes, yeah, and turn off the click because sometimes they hear that click and then their head's up and they're like, what was that? Mm. You know, or do some treat training, click, treat, click, treat, you know, so that they, <laughs> they start looking forward to that click, you know. And is there a, do you want it straight on or do you want a slight angle? It depends on the lighting. It is better if it's straight on because then when you mapping it out, you don't have to adjust, you know, kind of oh, like sure. try and figure out where the map sits over it. If it's between two points, you might be going, oh, it could be this or it could be that, you know, if it's a little angled too much. But right. And does it, and so you have, your chart there showed left and right eye. Are they very different? Yes. Um, everything that's on the right side of the body, you know, the, and even though horses don't have gallbladders, but you know, the liver, the gallbladder, all that portion. The only thing I think that uh, overlays part of double on um, one of the two sides, I believe it's the left side, it'll have both the left ventricle part of the gut and the right ventricle. You know, that portion of the gut will be seen on both portions of the eye. But yes, typically it's, it's down the middle. It's whatever's on this side of the spine, and whatever's on that side of the spine, you know, and the same with the brain. So you'll have your common denominator in the middle and then different portions. And I would love to know more about the brain, truthfully, because there's so many hormones that get secreted by the brain. That's one of the, remember that gut brain axis that I'm talking about, trying to keep your horses melatonin and serotonin and your, their cortisol levels in, in check or in balance can be huge. Um, I mean, it overlays into their training process. There, there's something we haven't even talked about. There's called stress rings in a horse's eye. And I don't, oh. I don't have one of those. And stress rings are, when you're looking at their eye, they'll be like this. There could be one or they could be three or four. They could be a little white or a little light or they could be, um, those will change, which is nice to see because I'll see a horse and they've got big stress rings and then you talk to them about, you know, um, their training, maybe they're being overtrained or maybe, let's say it's just in the, in the upper, in the brain area. Um, it could be physical, mental, emotional, you know, that's causing the stress rings. So then you go back and as a, you know, a thought process, is my trainer working my horse too hard? Does my horse understand what he wants? Is my horse a worry ward? Is he just worried that he's not doing it right? You know, um, can you back off a little bit, simplify the training, take a little more time, give him more time to process, you know? And then if it's, let's say if it's physical, maybe it's his dietary things. Maybe he's got some inflammation going on somewhere in that gut. Um, maybe making a dietary change or, or taking something or adding an herb that is more calming, seeing if that helps. I mean, it's kind of trial and error. You have to know every circumstance, but um, definitely when you get that corrected, you'll see those, those stress rings will, will close up a little bit and they'll relax. You might always have them because it it's, could be an inherited trait from, from his parents. His parents could be worry warts or 
maybe they don't process their B vitamins properly and then they have a tendency to you know, have a, a health issue in that regard. Um, and he's just inherited, he or she's just inherited. You know. Yeah, so, you know, again, it sounds like one of the things that's always important to have is a good team, a good, yes. uh, you know, a vet, a farrier, whether you have a body worker, um, whether you can um, kind of have discussions about nutrition to, to um, kind of see how this data point kind of can be looked at from the whole perspective and see what fits, what doesn't fit. Maybe, like you say, maybe this is inherited, but we can't always go back and look at their parents, their eyes. Right. Right. But the eye will still reflect it. You'll know that it was inherited and that this wasn't an injury or a, you know, something that, that poor management has caused. So do acute injuries show up in the eyes? Yeah, that's kind of a, a hit and miss on that. Um, I, in human eyes, I've seen both. I've had humans, and again, you know, I'll see something like, let's say it's a reproductive thing in a woman. I'll go through her whole eyes. We'll talk about a bunch of stuff. And then she'll say, you didn't tell me if I had a hysterectomy or not. And I'll say, I didn't see that, you know? And some of it is because they claim that when you, let's say had a hysterectomy, the anesthesia has turned off that part of the nervous system. And so it doesn't reflect, it didn't know that that part was taken away. Now I've had others where I'll be doing an eye exam on a, on a lady and I will say something about, you know, well, your uterus looks like it's busy working, you know, and she'll, oh yeah, I'm on my period, it's having, I'm having a hard one, you know, and so it is as sensitive as that, but not necessarily, and is that because this gal who's, I'm seeing it in her uterus, is that because she's got uh, polyps, or does she have uh, fibroids, does she have something that's causing her, her uterus to show up, I mean, she's not, her and I aren't talking about that, I'm just letting her know, but in, inevitably, I've had them say probably nine times out of 10, oh yeah, I'm on my cycle right now, you know. Um, but then they, I, they're broken arms that show up as this black line, and then there are broken arms that don't show up. So a part of it could be, um, in my opinion, and I could be proven wrong, um, it could be the um, person's constitution and we didn't really talk about that. It's something I would look for in a healthy horse if somebody was wanting to breed their horse. You're looking for a good, strong constitution um, versus a weaker constitution. And so maybe that person's always, that it showed up, maybe they've always had a, a weakness in their bones, maybe they're calcium deficient, and there's a reason for it. Where somebody with a good constitution, the break came and went and got healed and didn't, didn't reflect anything. So. Yeah, that's a hit or miss. I, I don't always see the consistency in that. Right. Yeah. So so certainly things that have been there for longer, kind of more chronic, definitely. Um, but when you talk about constitution, how can you determine the the strength of one's constitution in the eye? Okay. So remember that little picture I showed you of this little one? Oh yeah. You know, I that's a poor constitution. That was that was a very bad constitution. Okay. Okay. So then here you have a more healthy constitution. See how the fibers are very um, tightly woven. There's very little markings in the eye. Right. Um, you know, uh, it, it just show, reflects a, a healthier, healthier, uh, easier body. So the difference in a constitution, let's say in humans, and I'm, I'm gonna translate it this way because I'm sure it goes for horses. In humans, if you have a really good constitution, you're the kind of person that can get the flu or a cold, and you're, you're out there working, you're still doing whatever, you're working in the garden, you're shoveling, you're doing whatever, and, you, you know, and you're done. Might last a few days. You have a really poor constitution, you're the one laying on the couch going, I feel terrible, I just don't, I have no energy, I can't. And in theory, you know, again, I could be proven wrong, but in, in my perspective of it, when you aren't made up with the best of the best, so to speak, your body is elsewhere trying to rest and repair and trying to do its thing. So when it's busy doing that, it has to take energy away from your other organs or your other organs that have to function, your liver, your heart, your kidneys, are demanding and then the illness part has to wait or go on the, you know, a slower pace. 
that's how I interpret it. Um, where somebody with a good, strong, healthy constitution, everything's working at optimum, just go, go, go. And then this over here is like, ah, that's nothing. Let's fix it. Right, yeah. right. You can handle the insults much more easily, more resilient, bounce back faster, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, well put. Yeah. So, I, you know, I had a very old cat. I wonder if we, I'd had her for 18 years, and we don't really know how old she is when I got her. But her eyes changed a lot as she aged. She started to get spots in her eyes, and um, and it was evident that the eye was was showing these changes. And that's kind of a is that a normal process to see an eye age like that? Yeah, I would think so. Um, basically, because as things start to shut down with the normal aging process the inherent weaknesses of that person or animal is beginning to show up. Um, they're just not functioning as well. So I do have, I don't know if you'll be able to see very well on this. So like this is a, a picture of a mirror. Let's spotlight it to make it a little bit bigger for everybody. Okay, go for it. There you go. Okay. So you see this little bit of, let's see, where am I? Yes. This little <laughs> bit of white down here. Tiny bit, yep. Right here, you know. So this mare was 31 years old, lived a happy, healthy life, no, no health issues. She was, you know, brood mare, good, good horse. And just that showed up in the eye, both eyes, same on the lower level down there. So she basically was beginning, the circulation was beginning to die off. Um, she just basically laid down and died. Mm -hmm. yeah, nothing you could do there and um you know it was just part of the process everything else in the eye was was actually doing fairly well now this horse had been diagnosed by a vet you know it's the same eye she had been diagnosed by a vet 20 years before with uh melanoma mm -hmm. so could it have been something internal down in the lower extremities of her body that were perhaps filled with tumors or whatever I don't know. That's, that's a question I would like to learn more about. That's one of those, okay, why did this horse shut down? And, and that's the only thing that showed up. Yeah. And it, that's where, you know, the, it's difficult. Not, not a lot of people want their horse to go to a postmortem uh, so that you can yes. see what's actually going on, but that kind of correlation where you see changes. Um, so, so does it make sense to take regular pictures of your horse's eye, like in intervals? Um, yeah, so if you, let's say you have just purchased a horse and it's five, six, seven, ten years old, yeah, definitely get a baseline. You would, you would be able to find out, like I said, it's inherent problems. If it's like that one little pony that I showed you the, with the Cushing's, from day one, we knew she had digestive problems. Um, we shipped her from California to Oregon, and I thought I was going to lose her then when she got off the, off the transport. Her poop was this big. I mean, it was hard as a rock and that big. You know, she was dehydrated. She, the other horses were fine. She just, it was just her. She always had that nervous, pent up energy inside of her. Um, so we knew digestive was always her issue. We always tried to address it. And, um, you know, sadly, she did die of colic. Um, but it was, she ate, she drank, she pooped, and then she colic. You know, it was bam, just like that. Um, so yeah, it, it, you can, you can help, help them tell you can't, so to speak. Right. I mean, that's, that's when, with everything it's, you know, Dr. Feldenkrais would describe health as the ability to recover. And, yeah. you know, if we can't recover from something, then we're not healthy. And ultimately, you know, we are all going to pass, but there, I don't know anyone that has been able to overcome. Yeah, I don't want to go down that too, but... <laughs> Yeah, but yes, definitely. But it is kind of nice knowing, you know, let's say you're into rescuing horses and you go and you, you were able to find a horse that you can pull out of it for a few years, you know, through, like you said, through a teamwork scenario. You know, that is, that's really nice. You give that pony or that horse a few more years. I applaud somebody like that. You know, you, you, you know, it's, it's great. Yeah, so so it's very interesting. Uh, you know, I've um, 
I, I, like I said, with my old cat, it was so obvious that her eyes were changing and spots started to show up and that sort of thing. And I remember, I can't remember now why I had to take a close-up picture of her eye. Um, but I have this great close-up picture of her oh, eye. Oh, cool. I'm not happy when I took it, but, um, you know, that Bring was, it. Put it up. Yeah, it was really fascinating. And, you know, we, we tend to, to, to um, with horses' eyes, we, we tend to think about the softness of the eye, the texture of the eye, but not necessarily considering the organ of the eye, you know, in terms of that it can provide us with information. And I've heard of iridology for people and seen the charts and that sort of thing, but I didn't ha ever make that association with horses. So like if someone's really curious about, um, you know, learning more about iridology or are, are there any books or anything written about it? The, I, the only references I know of would be through um, Mercedes Colburn, through, through the Eye International. And then there's also one in Europe, I think it's Ellen Collinson. Um, they, I, I want to say she's like in Norway or somewhere in Sweden, maybe something. I, I'd have to double check that. But they also teach equine iridology. Um, and I, I, I believe once you are certified with them, um, if you were interested, there are practitioners that they have a list of throughout, let's say, the United States. Um, if, if you can find 20 or 30, you're doing pretty good, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it's not like there's one on every street corner. And one of the things that I, I can already see is like, oh, I want to go out and take a picture of my horse's eye. But then am I going to just like totally freak myself out, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? I think I call it respons being responsible owner. You know, if you can ward it off. I already know I'm going to lose my Tennessee Walker mare with cushions. She is, she showed signs of it before she's presented, you know, so mm -hmm. I can make her life more comfortable. Right. I know when to do some testing. I know when to try some medication, you know, it, it I can help her have a happy life. Right. And I think that's really what, what it's all about. Again, um, it's another data point and you have some other interesting little data points there. Some of the things on your table, some of the references oh. and resources, you know, we've had these people as guests, but I noticed that you had Dr. I've Herman. had this for years. <laughs> yes. Yes. I came across this. This is also in my trailer. Been used yep. from, from it's a uh, homeopathy for first aid by Dr. Joyce Harmon, a little book that she wrote. Yes. Back. Yes. That's, that's what I just showed the first aid. Yep. Yeah. And then um, this is the course that I'm taking right now. I've taken one of her courses uh, before. What's your so name? This, this is um, Diana Thompson. Oh, Diana she Thompson. Is, I'm going to have to get her on as a guest. I mean. Oh, please do. I just, I, she's not far from me. She's Central California and I'm taking her course. We would have way too much to talk about in a webinar. <laughs> you um, guys have to have coffee and tea first, right? Yeah. Um, but um, her name is way back from when I started with the Tellington work with uh, Linda Tellington Jones. Oh, yes. Well, let me show you this. Uh -huh. This is how long ago I knew about Linda Tellington Jones. Uh, wow. This back is a VHS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I first started with my horses, I had gotten a hold of the Linda Tellington Math Jones method. And it was only a few years after she started her, her process, all of my horses were T-touched. From the time they, the babies were born, they were all T-touched. I completely trained a horse her way. Um, delightful. Just the best. Yeah, I would I right. highly recommend that. Because yeah. you give them all the tools they need to be able to understand. It's really great. Yes. And then, of course, you've got Sharon Wilsey's video down there. And Yes, um, yes. And then I went to uh, go see Lucinda uh, this past summer. She had a a clinic on the uh, horse. She had a great webinar with Lucinda. That was really fun. Yes. Really yes. Fun. She's a, she's a character. She's a yeah. character. I love her. And then I know that you've been using Surefoot. You mentioned that you've been using Surefoot with your horses. Yes. I have your physio pad. And so, like I said, with my horse, who's, you know, pre Cushing's as far as I, I know, um, when the farrier comes out, I get that physio pad and I make him after he's done trimming, I'll have him put on there and I show him his work. And if it's a little too high, I ask him, why is that still high? Is that good for her? You know, explain to me, well, why are you leaving it like this? Um, is that enough frog? Is that deep enough? I mean, so I need to learn, but I also let him know that I'm a little, not particular. I just want the 
best for her. Well, you know? I love how you've used the physio pad to actually create the conversation with your farrier. Yes. You know, and, and I really, that's one of the things I just did a two day surefoot practitioner workshop this weekend in Pennsylvania, which is why my email is like getting out. But, um, you know, we, we need these points of entry where we can create a conversation and have a discussion because ultimately we're all trying to do the best by the horse. And, um, so sometimes, you know, it's, it's, if we tell someone that, what well, if we tell them versus ask them, if we yes. converse versus demand, I think we get a lot further for our horses as opposed, you know, you can easily offend someone, but how can you get them in on your side? Right? Exactly. Now can we create this, this really productive team for our horses? So I just love the fact that you're using the, the physio pad during the trim to get that conversation going. And, 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 and then he's open to what you're seeing instead yes. of, which is really fa fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not a demand kind of person. I'm, I'm a little more shy. If he was to be not cooperative or non-caring or whatever, I might look for another carry, you know, or ask around for another one. I, I don't, I want one that's proactive as well. Well, I think that's, you know, more and more we're starting to realize that this is not, um, uh, uh, they're the expert and we're just the owner paying the bills, that we want to be involved in our horse's process. We want to understand, and that's the kind of people that are watching these webinars, is people who want to be active and involved with their horse and with the progress that he's making and how we, can we make improvements and work as a team for the benefit of our horse so that we can have greater enjoyment. And that's really, you know, what exactly. it's all about. Um, and so, it, but it's just great because, um, somebody else was just telling me about how they were introducing Surefoot to their farrier. Um, and I, you know, I've been to Hoof Summit um, last year, and it's really funny because farriers tend to be a little, I would just say, a little slower adopting, right? Oh, There's okay. a little, that like they'll, one guy, he walked past our booth like for three days, <laughs> and he would stop and go, you know, my client has one of these, and I've, and I've, been using it with her horse and it really helped but it took him three days <laughs> oh <laughs> really good just watching him go by and um you know but that's the thing is we're trying to make the, everybody's life easier including the, the farrier and the trimmers yes sure foot um and so you know that's just really great feedback and um so when you talk about seeing the the hoof in the eye is there a particular location or is there like how is it that hoof imbalance shows up? Well, that's, a, that's more of a complicated question. Basically, let me just answer your first question. So on your chart down here. Yep. So it's right about six o'clock. Oh, okay. That's where you would find the, the back foot. Right about four o'clock would be where the, the front foot would be. Okay. So now... The complexity of it is, is, you know, they always shift their weight, you know, with their diagonals. So a lot of times you'll see, you know, a front left, back right, let's say, you know, that type of thing. So then sometimes you will actually see something in the jaw. Mm -hmm. And the jaw, of course, if it's not balanced, they don't carry themselves balanced. So then they may, you know, have uh, issues with their back end, or maybe they don't collect well, you know, and move forward properly. And it's really, you know, more a jaw or a TMJ, something up in, maybe they don't have a balanced fit. Maybe there's something, you know, uh, one pony I had that, that was a foal, she had a serious underbite, you know, and right. she ended up being put down at 23 because her back end was so low. Her, her, she was, her feet were like almost flat to the ground. She couldn't, she couldn't get her, her, her pelvis was fine. Genetically, her pelvis was strong but she just had no muscle anymore to hold herself up and, and be, but it was all because of her jaw. Her jaw threw her whole, her whole structural system off. So, you know, it is, it's a little bit more complex just to say it's the feet. And that's why starting with the farrier saying, okay, there's something going on with the feet. Um, maybe next time you have your, your dentist out and she's doing trims, you know, I mean, um, floats or something, you might say, so, Talk to me about my horse's mouth. Is it a pretty balanced mouth? You know, do you think a thick bit, small bit, no bit? I mean, what, what would be best for this horse's balance, you know? You know it's a perfect lead-in for my guest tomorrow. 
Natasha, oh, because we're going to be talking about bit fitting again. So oh, yay. she's actually the one who's founded the school to teach people how to be bit fitters. Um, and she's going to be my guest, Marcia, from the Netherlands. Yes, so, very good. Yeah, and you know, and again, we just keep seeing this this circle, like Jillian Kreinbring talked about the hyoid bone, and then we had her back and talked about the atlanto-occipital joint. And of course, we've had uh, one dentist talk about the teeth and the balance in the teeth and the whole jaw, TMJ, and all the nerves that are running through the head. Catherine Wyckoff did a really amazing webinar looking at the vagal and trigeminal nerves. Um, See, and that's what that's where I would like to find a little more specialty, you know, in my in my going forward with this is gut brain axis. How does it all fit with the with the vagus nerve? You know, it it, it all fits, and I just want to know how. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We well, and that's the thing is we're all sort of um, beetling away trying to find the answers to these questions, and I and I, you know sometimes we get another piece of information and we can fit it in. And then other times we just have to kind of go with it for a while because we're, you know, we, science hasn't caught up with what we're sensing and feeling and seeing, yeah. uh, you know, and that's one of the things about Surefoot is that we don't have any um, peer reviewed double blind research papers written about Surefoot, but we have so much evidence now with so many horses that have benefited yeah. that there's, you know, we have to go with it because it's obvious. Um, yeah but it is well, nice to have the research catch up. <laughs> that's true. And I think that letting the horse tell you something is important too. Um, you know, I can do a, a eye exam and I'm seeing, let's say a weakened kidney or something. And then I'll put my hand over the kidneys and sure enough, that horse is saying, oh yeah, that's the spot, you know? So Letting them interact with you a little bit is is important too. And sometimes they keep burying their head in your and it's like what is and I have found that more horses that bury their head in my arms like this, they're having stomach problems. Oh I had two walk up to me and push me backwards and they were colicking. And one was at a, a, a barn where I was keeping my horses at night. She did that to me and I thought, why are you pushing me like this? And then I stopped and I, I asked the gal, I go, I think your horse is colicking. And she, she looked kind of strange. Up, she goes, she colicked last week. I had the vet out. And so well, you better get him out again. So we gave her, you know, some herbs and some bran mash and pulled her through it a little bit till the vet could get there. But yeah, it, it, you let them tell you what's going on. It's important. Yeah, absolutely. And being able to uh, be open to that they're trying to tell us something. Yes. I think that is so important is to, to um, not to just instant, it's so easy to just instantly decide quit it or stop doing that instead of going, are, are they trying to show us something? And obviously it's not every time, right? We have to really- No, look. no. It has to be an unusual thing or, or if they keep backing up to you and you keep turning them around and they keep coming, it's like, what's back here that's your problem? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Annette, this has been really interesting. I'm, I'm certainly curious to find, uh, to go ahead and get a hold of Michelle and get a chart and then go out and see if I can't take a picture of my horse's eye. Yes, do. Really um, fascinated by it. And I think it'd just be fun, you know, just to play around with it. It really is. It is. And, and it, it's fun knowing what's going on inside your horse. It's, it's a great process. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. It's a great Monday conversation. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And just to remember, everybody, that you can find this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Tomorrow, my guest is Natasha, and we're going to talk about bit fitting again. And that was a really popular webinar. So this is just more information about that. So please join us tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And thank you again, Annette, and have yeah. a great bye -bye. day. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.